Number 1 A few details before I start my story. I live in Northern California in a small townhouse with my girlfriend. I've decided to change the names of both people and places just to be cautious. I don't want anyone going out to the beach I was at trying to dig up clues and instead find the trouble that I found. I'm sorry this is so long. I've tried to keep it as brief as possible. You have to understand that I've barely slept at all in days and it's difficult for me to keep my thoughts in order. Saturday, March 26th, John and I found the camcorder half buried in the sand on Stinson Beach. When I picked it up out of the sand, water leaked out from inside the camcorder. Sand was packed into every crevice and the battery pack was missing. I drawn it off with a beach towel, popped the cassette drive open. There was a digital cassette cartridge inside. It had a yellow plastic head and a Panasonic logo, but no label or sticker attached. It seemed like the camcorder itself was pretty much trashed, but we figured it still might be possible to recover the data on the tape itself. I had an older Sony digital camcorder at home that used the same type of tape. I took the tape and camcorder inside with me when John dropped me off at home later that day. I sat down at my computer desk and forgot all about it for almost a week. Thursday, March 31st. John came over again next Thursday and saw it on my desk. I told him I had forgotten about it and hadn't even tried to play back the tape yet. We popped it into my Sony camcorder and hooked it up to my PC's Firewire port, opened up Roxio's video capture application and told it to scan the tape for footage. Only one scene appeared on screen. I will describe it to you as best as I can recall. A few feet in front of the camera is a woman. Her back is to the camera and she is walking down a narrow dirt path, possibly even a deer trail. Tall dry grass and small bushes line either side of the path. Based on the lighting, it's most likely sometime in the early morning or evening. The sky is cloudless and tinged with a soft orange color. Other than the shuffle of her footsteps, the only thing that can be heard is seagulls crying and the soft sound of ocean waves breaking against the shore in the distance. She's wearing what used to be a one-piece swimsuit. The top half has been ripped or cut apart and now hangs down off her hips. She is naked from the waist up. Dozens of ugly red welts and cuts across her back. It looks like she had been whipped or beaten badly with a stick. A length of thin rope, more like a twine, has been used to bind her hands behind her back. The twine is wound so tightly against her wrists that you can see her hands have begun to turn a shade of blue from lack of circulation. The twine is cutting into her skin and small rivulets of blood have run down her hands and fingers, dripping onto the dirt trail behind her. During the course of the scene, she only takes a few dozen steps. The clip is only 30 seconds long. Right before the clip ends, a man's voice can be heard. Are you filming? You better not be filming yet. I told you to wait till we get inside. And then, the clip ends. John and I were both unsettled by that short scene on the tape. Someone's home video had gone horribly wrong. I tried to copy the clip to my computer, but every time we played the file back, it was just a mess of scrambled green lines with no audio. John took the tape with him when he went home later that evening. He wanted to try to use his MacBook and his parents' camcorder to see if he was able to recover the clip. He said that maybe it was just a problem with my Firewire cable. It was the last time I ever saw him. Friday, April 1st. At this point, I can't think of any unusual happenings. A normal Friday workday, no different from dozens of other Fridays before it. I called John to ask him about the tape, but he said he hadn't had the time to look at the tape again. But he was going to stop by his parents' house after work and borrow their camcorder for the weekend. Sunday, April 3rd. John calls me. It was in the evening, sometime before 7, I think. He sounded excited and tells me that he was able to get the clip saved onto his Mac. The video plays back, but the sound is missing. I tell him to upload the video online, but he wants more time to try to get the audio working too. Wednesday, April 6th. Unable to get a hold of John for two days. Calls are going straight to voicemail. Finally, he calls me on Wednesday just as I'm getting ready to leave work. I don't think I noticed it at the time, 
but looking back on the events, his voice sounded odd. There was almost no inflection to his speech. It was flat and emotionless. I thought he was calling about the tape, but when I asked, he told me it wasn't important anymore. He said that he found something and we needed to go back to the beach. It takes almost two hours to get to Stinson from my house, and I told him that there was no way I was able to get out there on a week night after work. And even if I could, I would be nearing dark by the time we got out of there. For some reason, this seemed to make him angry. I promised I would go on Saturday with him. He said he needed to go that night, and there was something very important. He kept saying that he had something to show me. I asked what, but he said I had to see it for myself. Finally, he called me a stubborn asshole and hung up. Thursday, April 7th. John won't answer my calls. His voicemail says his inbox is full and won't accept any more new messages. Friday, April 8th. When I get up to take a shower in the morning, there is a small amount of wet sand spread out on the bottom of the tub. I think that maybe Sarah has only now gotten to rinsing her bathing suit from the time we were at the beach two weeks ago. Although I don't see her suit hanging up to dry anywhere in the bathroom, it's mildly puzzling, but I forget about it as soon as I leave for work. Only now do I realize it was the start of the strange occurrences that were about to drive me into a frantic state that I'm currently in today. Later at work, my phone chimes indicating that I have a new voicemail. I had noticed the phone was ringing, but this isn't entirely unusual, as I don't have the best reception inside the office. It's certainly not the first time this has happened. I dial into my voicemail and it's a message from John. He sounds calm, no hint of his previous anger. I'm going back to Stinson again tomorrow morning. Meet me there. There is something I want to show you. I finish up my workday and go home. I decide to tell Sarah about the tape and how it's making John act very strange. But when I get home, she still hasn't gotten back from work. I make myself dinner and watch TV, and there's still no sign of her. I call up her work, and they tell me she left when her shift ended at 4 p.m. I call her mom in LA to ask if she's heard any word from Sarah, but she hasn't, and seems as worried as I am. I fall asleep on the couch watching TV. Sarah was still gone when I woke up on Saturday morning. With Sarah missing, there's no way I can go meet up with John. I go online and try to find any reports of traffic accidents on Friday evening. Finally, I decide to call the sheriff's office. They tell me that I can file a missing persons report. There is no waiting period to do so. I give them all the details, and they promise to call me back as soon as they hear something. Sarah's mom calls me again in the evening. She's very upset that no one can find any trace of her daughter. Sunday, April 10th. I awoke from the most vivid nightmare in the early hours of Sunday morning. In the dream, I'm sleeping in my bed. I wake up and I'm freezing cold. The bed is totally soaked with nearly frozen water and it reeks of salt and seaweed. Everything is wet. The mattress, the pillows, the blankets, everything. My arms are wrapped around Sarah and her body is just as cold as the water, possibly even colder. I prop myself up and turn on the lamp next to the bed. Sarah is asleep on her side with her back to me and I see that her arms have been bound behind her back with twine. It's turned her hands blue and there's blood seeping out from the cuts in her wrists. I am paralyzed by absolute terror, the kind you can only experience in a dream. Slowly Sarah rolls from her side onto her back and I see her face. It's her, but she looks deformed. Her face is too broad, and her nose looks flattened and smashed, almost like she's pressed up against a piece of glass. Her eyes are bright and shiny. Her mouth is locked into a terribly wide grin. There are far too many teeth inside her mouth. She tells me there's something she needs to show me. I wake up in an empty bed, bathed in sweat and tangled in the bed covers. I swear... I can still smell the ocean. Eventually, I leave the house to get food. On my return, I noticed wet, sandy footprints leading from the grassy lawn right up to my front door. There's a wet piece of twine wrapped tightly around my door handle. When I untie it, 
I notice my hands have been stained a dull red. Monday, April 11th. I couldn't sleep. I called in to work and told them that I was feeling sick. I lay on the couch all day watching TV, and I have no appetite. At some point, I must have dozed off. I woke up and the TV was blaring noise. A local news report was on, and a reporter was yelling, almost screaming his news report. It was a story about hundreds of dead bodies washing up on the beach last night, all of them with their hands bound behind their backs. He then looks directly into the camera, almost like he's looking right at me, and says, You need to get to the beach. There's something I need to show you. The TV turns off. My apartment is freezing, and I can smell salt water. Tuesday, April 12th. Another night of fitful sleeping, but at least no more dreams. I am exhausted from stress and lack of sleep. It's difficult to keep my thoughts in order. I called my work and told them that I was still sick. For some reason, I didn't want them to know about my missing girlfriend. In the evening, a deputy from the sheriff's called me. He told me that they found Sarah's car abandoned in a parking lot near Stinson Beach. I tried asking him more questions, but he seemed very elusive and wouldn't give me any straight answers. I hope they don't consider me a suspect in her disappearance. He told me that I needed to meet them at Stinson first thing tomorrow morning so they could ask me some questions. Shouldn't they want to question me at the sheriff's office? Before he hung up, he told me that it was imperative that I be at Stinson tomorrow morning. He said there was something he needed to show me. I called Sarah's parents and her dad answered the phone. I told them about the deputy finding her car. He said it wasn't important anymore and that it was going to be okay. Just make sure you meet with the deputy tomorrow morning, okay? There is something you need to see. Tuesday, April 13th. Another nightmare. God, I hope it was a nightmare. I'm so tired from not sleeping. It's hard to tell what's real and what isn't. In the dream, I was lying in bed. The clock said 3.28 a.m. I woke up to a soft tapping noise coming from the bedroom window. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep. I hear the tap two more times and then Sarah's voice. Walter, I know you're in there. Please let me in. There's something I want to show you. Walter? The bedroom window was on the second floor. I ran downstairs. My gaze locked onto the floor, afraid of what I might see outside the window, even though the blinds were drawn closed. I fled into the small guest bedroom on the first floor and locked the door behind me. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The house is filled with the smell of seawater again, stronger than before. Wednesday, April 14th. I am terrified and nearly mad with the need for sleep. I don't know what to do or who to ask for help. I know I can't stay locked in this room all day. I've decided to write all this down and post it online. Some place where I know people can read it, but possibly won't take it seriously. I'm afraid I won't make it back home ever again. But I have to go down to Stinson. I have to talk to the sheriff. He's already called me twice asking me where I am and if he shouldn't just send someone to pick me up and drive me down there. Hopefully everything will work out okay and I'll be back home later this evening. Hopefully. Number 2 As an only child growing up in Clarence, Iowa, at most times I found myself playing alone in my backyard or sitting in front of my television watching whatever we had on VCR. DVD players had already been out for years at the time, but my father was working as a mechanic in some random guy's garage, and we really couldn't afford to buy a DVD player. I had to resort to VHS tapes, but at least my mother would take me to the used game store, which also sold VHS tapes and DVDs, Every once in a while, I became addicted to owning VHS tapes, even as a six-year-old boy, and honestly, I still am to this day. The Disney and Tim Burton films were my absolute favorites. I just could not get enough of Toy Story and The Lion King. 
My grandmother had given me four tapes as an early birthday gift. I don't remember the other two, but I do remember receiving All Dogs Go to Heaven and one I had never heard of called Where Children Play. There was a man in some kind of pig costume on the cover, which was kind of like Mickey Mouse, but instead of a mouse, it was a pig. He was wearing overalls as part of the costume. There were children surrounding him, and in the background was a playground. The title was displayed on the cover in those hideous colors from the 90s. Sorry if you ever had to sport those colors back in the day. According to the back of the cover, the tape consisted of three episodes. It took me a few days before I decided to actually watch the tape. I admit, I was kind of horrified by the creepiness of the pig. But I popped the tape in nonetheless. It started out with birds chirping and a friendly melody playing as the man in the pig costume walked awkwardly down a street. Children followed behind him, walking just as awkwardly. Oh gee, he said suddenly. I didn't see you there. They continued walking. We're on our way to the playground. Care to join us? They were moving, but they didn't look like they were actually going anywhere because they passed by the same park bench and trees over a dozen times. The bird's chirping was clearly some kind of loop because it was the same chirping sound over and over again. Well, let's go, the pig man yelled, just before the scene switched to the playground. Hello, boys and girls, he said, as he stood in a circle surrounded by children. Hello, Mr. Piggyton, the children yelled back. The next few minutes was nothing but children and the pig man singing songs. I recognized all of the songs they sung, except one that I had never heard before. Apparently it was the theme song to the movie. The lyrics of the chorus went like this. It's where the children play together and be best friends forever. Hide, and I will try to find you. We really love each other. Nothing could be better than spending forever with you. The melody of the song was the same as the melody from the start of the tape. There were adults in the background, sitting on benches, while either watching the children or reading a book or newspaper. I'm assuming they were the children's parents. After they got done singing, they played games such as hide and seek, kickball, tag, and hopscotch. It was just an innocent children's show, and I really enjoyed it. The pig man no longer creeped me out. He actually reminded me of Barney the Dinosaur, with all the life lessons he would share, and it proved to be very educational. Usually, the children would wave goodbye to the pig man, as they would head off home with their parents, as another episode started, but that didn't quite happen after the second episode. Instead, the third episode started out in some dark room with a dim light flickering on and off. There was a man in the corner of the room with his back turned from the camera. He was completely motionless as he hummed the melody to the show's theme song. After a while, the humming turned into loud singing and he would get louder and louder before the door swung open, showing an agitated man with a wooden baseball bat. Shut the hell up, you fucking pig, the man yelled before throwing a slice of bread into the room. The guy moved from the corner of the room and crawled his way to the bread, sniffing it before shoving it down his throat. He then stood up and dragged himself to the door. More, he yelled, pounding on the door. I want more. Get the hell away from the door, a muffled voice yelled from the other side. But daddy, I want more. It was odd hearing such a manly voice calling out Daddy. Get the hell away from the door, the muffled voice yelled even louder. The guy finally walked away from the door and sat in the middle of the room, where there was a pile of toys. Daddy is such a meanie, isn't he, Teddy? The guy asked a stuffed bear. Yes, he is, he replied to himself, but in a different voice. He grabbed a toy car from the pile. Vroom, vroom. He said as he slid the car across the room. The scene suddenly cut to a different setting. This time, it was the pig man standing alone in the street while slowly dancing to his own humming. There were three ambulances in the background and I watched as they carried a dead person into one of them. At that point, I should have turned it off, but I simply could not stop watching. 
I was staring into his dark eyes as he spun round and round. It felt so real, as if I was there, in that street, watching him. He then stopped dancing and turned to the camera. Shh. He whispered, with his finger pressed to his lips, before continuing his awkward, creepy dancing. The scene cut back to the room where the guy was playing with the toys. This went on for almost 10 minutes before his father walked in. Give me those goddamn toys, his father said, picking them up one by one. You're too old for this shit. But daddy, he cried. Please, please let me keep Teddy. He followed behind his father who left the room, slamming the door shut on the way out. The guy sat on the floor crying before he suddenly stopped. At least I still have you, Toby, he said. But there was nobody else in the room. You'll never leave me, will you? He stood from the floor and laid down on his bed. I had a dream last night. Mr. Piggy Tim was real, and all of us children were dancing and singing along with him. You were there too, Toby. It was the best dream I ever had. He tucked himself under the thin white sheets. One day, I'm going to have my own town where only children can play, and nobody else. Just us children and Mr. Piggyton. Muffled sounds of yelling could be heard from outside the room. Mommy and Daddy are arguing again. He turned to his side, facing the dirty white wall, and began to loudly sing the show's theme song. He would get louder and louder as the muffled yells continued. Louder and louder he would get before the door swung open and the agitated man, his father, walked into the room holding a bat. I told you to shut the hell up, didn't I? He yelled before swinging the bat, hitting his son in the head. He was knocked unconscious and dragged out of the room by his father, a trail of blood following behind them. The scene cut to a guy sitting in the corner of the room. His head turned back to the camera. There was a giant bruise on the back of his head. He was rocking slowly back and forth, lightly banging his head off the wall. His father then walked into the room. You quit that damn banging, you hear? He said before throwing a slice of bread on the floor. The guy crawled over to the bread, showing his face to the camera. His father made sure he wouldn't be able to speak. He wouldn't be able to sing that song again. He had stitched his mouth shut. His father laughed at him as he desperately tried to eat the bread. He then left the room, and the guy stood up from the floor, before the tape cut yet again, to a scene of the pigman standing alone in the middle of an abandoned playground. It was foggy out, and it was almost completely silent. The only thing that could be heard was the singing of children as it echoed through the old playground. They were singing the show's theme song. The pigman was completely motionless, staring into the camera with his dark eyes, before finally making a movement. He put his finger on his lips, and he whispered, Shh. After the pigman had disappeared, the tape had cut back to the room, and what I saw finally made me decide to turn it off. The guy was hanging from the ceiling by his neck. His mouth was still stitched shut as his body moved slowly side to side. The camera then began to move. Clearly somebody was moving it. As the camera turned to the other side of the room, I noticed the pig costume set neatly on the floor. Its dark eyes were staring into the camera. The scene then changed to a bathroom where I noticed the pig man was holding the camera in his right hand and a butcher knife in the other. His costume was stained in blood, appearing as if he had just slaughtered an animal. I turned the tape off right afterwards, but everything I saw on the tape already pierced into my mind as something I would have nightmares about almost every night. I didn't tell my mother about the tape, nor did I tell her about the nightmares that it caused. I can remember the nightmares very clearly, as if I'm not allowed to just forget about them forever. It's as if they were planted in the back of my mind and are never completely gone. On one of those nights, when I drifted off into a nightmare, I found myself alone in a silent town that looked to be abandoned. The walls of the buildings as well as the sidewalks had writing on them. Words such as Mr. Piggyton and Play were drawn with chalk. There were also random names written as well. 
The most disturbing was a large drawing of the pig man. It was drawn on the walls of an abandoned candy store. Below that were the words, Well, let's all have some fun. The streetlights flickered every other minute as the sun hid behind the clouds, keeping the town a bit gloomy. I continued walking, unsure of where to go, but desperate to get back home. As I walked, I could hear laughing children echo all around me, and then the melody of the theme song echoed along with them. Looking ahead, I saw something, or someone, standing off in the distance. It took me a dozen extra steps to see who it was. I stood in fear when I noticed the pig man in his blood-stained costume, watching me with a butcher knife in his hand. He just watched me, staring with the darkness of his eyes, paralyzing me. I heard him breathing. I felt his breath hit my cold, pale face. Even though I was still a distance away, he finally made a movement as he put his finger to his mouth and whispered, Shh. The whispered echoed past the abandoned barber shop, past the pizza shop, and right through me. He then disappeared, leaving me alone in the abandoned town, but not for too long. I felt his breath as it hit the back of my neck. I turned around to complete darkness, a darkness that I would soon realize were his eyes. It was completely silent, but his high-pitched voice broke that silence. Well, hello, Grayson, he said before I finally woke up from that nightmare. It was only a dream, but it felt so real. I had many different nightmares involving the pig man, but none were as terrifying as the dream I had a few weeks after watching the tape. I was in a bedroom, walls written on with markers and crayons. I got out of the bed, that needless to say was not my own, and I made my way into the hall. I heard singing of children as their voices echoed from room to room. I looked in each of the rooms as I walked by, noticing nothing but toys and colorful written walls. I heard the music playing, the music from the tape, and I walked into a room, noticing it was coming from an old radio. Next to that old radio was a diary with Mr. Piggyton drawn on the cover. I opened the diary and read the first page. Mr. Piggyton said this is my new home. I like it here. I have so many toys. He said that I can stay here forever and ever. I love my new home. Mr. Piggyton gave me a choo-choo train. He made it for me and I like it a lot. I miss my mommy and daddy, but Mr. Piggyton said I can never see them again. It's okay because Mr. Piggyton said that I can have any toy I want. I can hear my mommy. She's crying for me to come home. Mr. Piggyton said that if I was a good boy, I could go home. I don't believe him. I closed the book and the dark eyes of Mr. Piggyton crept into my head. I didn't want to read his name, because every time I did, I would picture him standing off in the distance, holding a blood-covered knife in his hand. I walked out of the room, trying to shake him from my head, but that was impossible, because he was standing right at the end of the hall. I was not imagining it that time. He slowly walked up to me. He was holding a blue remote control race car in his arms. I backed up until my back hit the wall. He stood right in front of me, head tilted. Hello, Grayson, he said in his goofy, high-pitched voice. I made this just for you. I opened the staircase door and ran down the stairs. I looked behind me, noticing Mr. Piggyton following me. Don't run, Grayson. I only want to play with you. I continued running. It isn't safe to run down the stairs. I remembered him saying that in the videotape. Watch me do it, Grayson. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Still, I continued running. I ran through the door at the bottom of the stairs and ran down the hall until I saw somebody in one of the rooms. It looked like a young boy. He was wearing blue and white striped pajamas and just stood there, staring out the window with his back turned to me. I looked back, hearing Mr. Piggyton's voice echo out from behind the staircase door as he continued. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. I went inside the room, despite the creepy kid staring out of his window, and I locked the door behind me. I slowly walked towards the kid and tapped his shoulder. 
He pointed outside. I glanced out of the window and saw nothing but an old abandoned theater. I looked around the room, noticing the writing was different from every other room I had been in. I want more was written all over the walls. The kid finally turned from the window and I noticed his mouth was stitched shut. He had a name tag that read, Hello, I'm Evan. He picked up a blue marker from the floor and wrote on the wall, pointing at his writing afterwards. This is where the children play, he wrote. There was a loud knock at the door and it shook the entire room. The kid sat in the corner, covering his ears as he continually knocked his head against the wall. The pounding continued as I tried opening the window. The door eventually creaked open and a piece of bread was thrown into the room. The kid, Evan, ran over to the bread and tried desperately to eat it, but his mouth had been sewn shut. There was no way he could. He then stood up and walked to the window. He stood there and pointed out. I looked again, noticing nothing but the old theater. I got closer to the window, trying to find what it was he wanted me to see. I noticed through the reflection on the window, a name tag on my shirt. Hello, I'm Grayson, it read. Mr. Piggyton suddenly appeared on the other side. I made this for you, Grayson, his muffled voice said as he held the toy car up to the window. That's when I woke up. It still baffles me to think how I could still so vividly remember those nightmares. My seventh birthday finally came a day later. We had a party at the local playground, and for obvious reasons, I didn't want to be anywhere near a playground. I apparently had no choice because it was too late to have it anywhere else. Everything was okay at first. That is until I opened my gifts. I received more VHS tapes from my parents and grandmother. I also received clothes and toys, but what really scared me was the last present I opened. My mother read the writing on the tag. To Grayson, she read. It had no other name on it, so nobody knew who it was from, but they had given it to me anyway. I opened it noticing it was a box, but it's what was inside the box that frightened me. I opened it and pulled out a blue remote control race car. I looked up from the table we were sitting at and saw a group of kids sitting in a circle nearby. In the middle of that circle was the pig man. He was watching me, staring at me with his dark eyes. He put his finger to his lips and then whispered, Shh. The children were singing that goddamn song that I had grown so horrified of. I ran to my mother who had no idea what was going on and I just laid in her arms watching Mr. Piggyton as he watched me. I never returned to any playground ever again. Years went by and the nightmares finally stopped. The pig man was abandoned in the back of my mind where he stayed there until a few months ago. I was cleaning out my closet looking for old VHS tapes I could give to the local Goodwill. I thought that my mother had thrown it out, but apparently it was here. It was here all this time. I didn't remember much about it at first. The only thing I remembered was that I was really horrified by it for some reason. I put the tape in the donation box and kept the box in the closet until I went to the Goodwill the next day. The next morning I woke up to a song being played from the living room. I remembered the song, but I couldn't quite put my finger on where I heard it from. I walked into the living room and noticed my son, Grady, sitting in front of the television. What you doing, buddy? I asked. I looked up at the screen and noticed where children play, displayed in bright purple, teal, yellow, and pink colors. And that's when I saw him, Mr. Piggyton. I remembered how terrified I was of him. I told my kid to go make himself a bowl of cereal before school, and I sat in front of the television. I remembered every detail, every detail of the tape, even the scenes I had yet to be reunited with, even the dreadful nightmares they caused. After I dropped Grady off at school, I remember leaving off with Mr. Piggyton standing in front of the mirror, covered in blood, after which he left the room and walked through the house with the camera. In the living room was a woman laying on the ground, bleeding from obvious stab wounds on her back. She appeared to be dead. As Mr. Piggyton passed through the kitchen, 
he stood in front of a decapitated man whose head was a few feet from his body. It was hard to tell, but I noticed that the man was the agitated father. He had visible stab wounds all over his body, from his neck down to his ankles. Mr. Piggyton sat down the camera and leaned over the body with a knife. More, he screamed as he continuously stabbed the body. I want more. He kept the knife on the floor, picked up the camera, and walked toward the front door. He was humming to that horrifying song as he left the room, leaving behind the brutally murdered corpses of his parents. The scene then cut to Mr. Piggyton dancing alone in the middle of the street, with three ambulances behind him. That went on for over an hour. Even after the ambulances had already left, the streetlights were flickering and he was there, dancing in the middle of the street, to the sound of nothing. I'm sure in his mind, he was dancing to the tune of his theme song. After I watched the video, I buried it in my bedroom closet, keeping it away from my son and anyone else who would mistake it for an actual children's tape. I looked up where children play online, but I couldn't find anything on it. I then searched Mr. Piggyton, and it took me a while before I could actually find something on him. I found a form on Reddit that was posted a few months before. It had no replies, but it was posted by somebody named Casey Brandon 9 Here is what she wrote. I'm not sure if anybody would believe me, and I don't care if you do or not. If you've ever heard of anybody named Mr. Piggyton, surely enough, you'd have to believe me. I first came across Mr. Piggyton when I was six years old. My mother would take my brother and I to the playground in our hometown. Mr. Piggyton showed up one day, appearing from the woods that was near the playground. He was a man in a pig costume, wearing overalls. Anyway, Mr. Piggyton may seem fun and normal at first, but he's far from it. He's actually a nightmare. A nightmare that you cannot escape or wake from. He is the reason that some children can sleep at night, and the reason that others are mysteriously missing. I've had nightmares about him up until I was ten, and then they recently returned. I just want to warn any parents out there whose children ever heard or spoke the name Mr. Piggyton. He may seem imaginary, and you may not be able to see him, but I assure you he is real, and he is kidnapping children all over the world. Please. Help me stop, Mr. Piggyton. I replied to the post, but never got an answer. Months went by, and I decided just to forget about the tape and everything dealing with Mr. Piggyton. My son, who was only six years old at this time, had this imaginary friend named Neil since he was about three. I thought he was finally over his imaginary friend phase, but one night, I heard him talking to somebody who, in my mind, was not there. Who are you talking to? I asked as I entered his bedroom. Nobody. He was always a bit shy when it comes to his imaginary friend. Is it Neil? I asked. He shook his head no. He doesn't want me to call him Neil anymore. He looked towards the closet door and smiled. I didn't see anybody, but I felt something. It was a feeling I cannot explain. A feeling that we weren't alone in that room. Because now he has a real name, he said. What's his real name? He looked over to the door behind me, a big smile on his face. What's his real name? I asked again. I'm not sure what I expected for him to say, but this sure wasn't it. His name is Mr. Piggyton. Number 3 Graphic Warning I grew up as an only child in a very high-tech family. My dad was a broadcast engineer for KTCI in St. Paul, and my mom was a computer programmer for a company that made dental record keeping software. I followed in my mother's footsteps to become a computer programmer, 
Her and I were always rather close. I scored a rather well-paying first job with a rather well-known aerospace firm. They were located in Maryland, so I had to make quite a big move. Being a bit of a pack rat as a teenager, I loaded up about 10 boxes worth of what was admittedly junk and packed it in the back of a U-Haul, and the three of us made a nearly 16-hour trip to Clarksville. My mom and dad couldn't stay very long due to mom having run up all her vacation time, so they didn't do much other than help me bring in boxes and departed shortly after. Unpacking throughout the evening, I discovered many of these boxes contained things I hadn't seen in years. It was always a nice nostalgia trip to go through all these links to the past. I had my high school planner, the composition notebook I filled with crudely drawn newspaper style comics. Toys I loved and had long forgotten about. One of these things I found at the bottom of the box was an old VHS tape. Scrawled across the front were things like Michael playing, July 1994. Michael's fourth birthday, October 1994. Immediately I recognized it as one of the many childhood family videos my dad made when I was a baby. My dad was not only a broadcast engineer, he was an out and out audio video enthusiast. This video had to have been one of 50 made of us. I remember quite well watching a few of them with family during the fits of nostalgia we had together. But because there were so many, I don't remember having seen all of them. A great deal of them were simple mundane things, like going to the park, or me playing Nintendo. Nothing all that interesting or remarkable. That being said, I'm a sucker for nostalgia, and I wanted to relive just a part of what I remember to be the happiest days of my life in infancy. I had long since disposed of my VCR, so that following weekend I made a trip to the flea market to pick up a new one so I could watch this video. One salesman had a ton of them new in box. He said they were unsold stock discovered in a shipping container. You couldn't go wrong with a VCR in new condition for 10 bucks. I drove home, plugged it into the last TV I had with composite inputs, and popped in the tape. The tape began with the customary blank static, and then scan lines disappearing as they floated over a muddied window to happier times. There I was, in my old bedroom, Playing with one of my favorite teddy bears as mom sat next to me, I even remembered how much I loved that toy. A white teddy bear that played a cute panzo electric tune when he was squeezed. He even had a heart that would shine many colors as the song played. I was tempted to shed a tear at the innocent and childish love I had once felt for that toy. Something stopped me from doing so. Some kind of inexplicable restraint. It was just a dumb toy after all. A part of me wondered where he was today, and the other part of me cynically remarked how surely there were hundreds and thousands of bears of the same type. Mindlessly and thoughtlessly produced by a factory, I wanted to find him and hug him right then and there. But again, I reminded myself it was just a dumb toy. My dad had been filming the scene right in front of my mother and I. I kept hugging the toy to hear the tiny song play, and its plastic heart shine joyfully. Mom remarked how the toy and I were inseparable, and from behind the camera you could hear my dad agree. He sounded strangely disinterested. I thought perhaps he was tired. Mom eventually fetched a basket from across the room, containing all sorts of stuffed animals, and brought them to where I was, planting them in between us. Watch this. Michael, do you want to play with Goofy? I shook my head no. Do you want to play with Mickey? Again, I shook my head. How about Teddy Ruxpin? He talks. See? She moved the mouth up and down on the doll, which obviously had no batteries in it, but I shook my head no once again. Mom looked up at the camera laughing. Do you want to keep playing with him instead? I smiled ear to ear, nodding yes. I hugged the bear again, and the adorable tune played. The heart lit up with its beautiful colors. My dad said something else from behind the camera in a very cynical tone. I really don't know why you keep buying him these things. Oh, shut up. He loves them. Michael, do you like your bear? I nodded yes once again. My mom reached over to give me a hug. My dad put the camera on the floor, and the scene filled with my mom's knees 
and the carpet just as the video started to run scan lines down itself, and the scene became very garbled. My dad's voice became very distorted, almost like he was yelling about something, but I couldn't understand it. The static then enveloped the screen. The cheapo VCR had eaten the tape. Immediately I hit stop and ejected it. I grew up around VHS tapes, so this would occasionally happen, especially with a certain variety of made in China VCRs, my dad derisively referred to as chink shit. The reason I mention this is because almost as soon as I pulled the tape out of the VCR, I noticed that the tape had not been mangled and hanging out of the cassette, it ejected normally. Now I know damn well that almost every time a cheapo VCR ate the tape, it would eject a bent up mess, film hanging out and all that, but I pulled this one clean out of the VCR, no trouble. I flipped the lid open on the tape to inspect it. Sure enough, it was crinkled, maybe it did eat up the tape. I wasn't convinced, maybe the tape was messed up before I started watching it. I grabbed an ink pen from the desk and shoved it into the hole in the back then slowly wound the spool using my knuckle. Sure enough, the tape came up garbled as I was unwinding it. The tape was messed up long ago, some other time, or so I reasonably figured. I popped the tape back into the VCR and played it, until it went past the messed up part. Almost nothing was legible throughout. It looked vaguely like a scrambled porno channel, but it kept playing at an odd speed. My parents were saying something to each other, but it sounded like garbled and distorted yelling. There was also a big boom somewhere in the middle that made me jump out of my chair when I heard it. Eventually, the lines and static gave way to a scene in an empty room where my mom and I had once been sitting. The audio came back to normal. The scene was now the camcorder, still on the ground, but looking like it was on its side. Mom and I were nowhere to be found. After about three minutes or so, I saw feet. I saw feet up the right side of the TV and I heard my dad speak. All right, I love you. My mom, notably less cheery than she was before, sniffled as if she were sick and replied, I love you too. I heard a kiss and then she left the room. My dad picked up the camcorder. It flashed at the window briefly before the white fade out effect. Something did not sit right with me about this. It was utterly bizarre, and something seemed rather familiar about it. What happened on the part that got messed up? If I didn't know any better, I'd say the two of them had seen a ghost. I rewound it and tried to play through the crumpled part of the tape, but all I heard was distorted shouting and screaming, and that boom in the middle, and all I saw was static with distorted pieces of scenery cutting in. I couldn't really make out anything from the scenery that remained, except for the fact my dad picked up the camcorder and was kind of waving it around the room. I had to find out what happened. My mom and dad had notoriously poor memories, so it was doubtful they even remembered what happened. I called them and struck up a casual conversation. I asked my mom if she remembered all those tapes. She said yes. She used to love watching those. I mentioned that I found a tape at the bottom of one of my moving boxes. Instantly, she fell silent. Mom? Which one? Uh, hold on. I popped it back out of the VCR and looked at the label. It says my fourth birthday. What number is it? Your father numbered them on the back. I flipped the tape over. Scribbled on the back was the number two written in marker. Looks like the second one. Michael, please don't watch it. I need you to bring it home. What? Why? I was just watching it yesterday. I wanted to ask you why- Michael, this is a bit embarrassing, but we just need that tape back. My father must have heard her talking. He butted in quickly and took the phone. What's going on, Michael? Hi, Dad. What's- Michael, do yourself a favor. Bring that tape home and don't watch any more of it. I laughed out loud. Why? What's wrong with it? Dad's tone got indignant. You want to know, Mike? You really want to know? Your mom and I made a sex tape. That's what's wrong. 
We put it at the end of one of your home movies. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dad. You guys, no way. What's the joke? But Dad was nothing but serious. Michael, don't watch it. Bring it home. Book a flight home for Saturday. Bring it with you. Why bring it home? Why not just destroy it or throw it out? Come on, Dad. What's really happening? Michael, I'll take care of it. I don't want to risk anyone seeing your mother like that. Please, just bring it home. I don't know if he was trying to dissuade me from watching the rest of the tape, but if he was, it sure as hell didn't work. It only provoked my curiosity. I decided to risk the danger of seeing my parents having sex, mostly because I didn't believe them. But I put the tape back in the VCR and fast forward it past my fourth birthday, the trip to the Discovery Zone, and the time we went to the park. All the while I'm thinking if it was true, it had to be the shortest sex tape anyone's ever made. A scene of us at church faded out. Some static was left on the tape. And then, the blue stop screen came up. The VCR clicked and began to rewind. That was it? I ejected the tape, and sure enough, it was over. Where was the supposed sex? I looked up and only then, it dawned on me. If there was something my parents didn't want me to see, it had to be in that crumpled section of the tape. I was pissed off at Dad's lie, but I refrained from calling him and yelling at him because I knew it wouldn't get me any closer to an answer. So instead I got to work fixing the crumpled part of the tape. I needed to get it fixed just enough to see what happened. I rewound the tape, played it back. My dad put the camera on the ground, and then the scan line started again. I stopped it immediately and ejected it. I unwound the tape delicately across my desk and pressed it together as best as I could, using a pair of credit cards. The only thing I had lying around that wouldn't demagnetize it. Gently I wound it back together. This time the scene became clearer, but it was still impossible to see what was going on. The static gave way to a very distorted image. The audio was the same creepy slow garbled screaming. The big boom still happened right there in the middle. It was about then I realized I couldn't fix this tape on my own, but I suddenly remembered the place right around the corner that did VHS to DVD transfers. They could almost definitely do something about this. I walked into the tiny shop the next morning with the tape and asked the man if he could restore the damaged part. Well, kid, ordinarily I can't. I can try to press all the wrinkles out of it and get something back. No guarantees, though. It'll probably play funny. I'll pay anything to get a look at that part of the tape. Like I said, no guarantees. I took $100 out of my wallet and put it down on the counter. Look, I trust you. Could I get it done now? The man looked down at the counter and back up at me. Alright, follow me. Picking up the tape and the bill, he stood up. The two of us walked into the back, where he had a workshop and plenty of what looked like very old video equipment. At first the man pretty much did the same thing I tried to do with the tape, only he used what looked like plastic padded steel tongs to gently press the wrinkles out. He had all the precision of a surgeon, and I admired his swift, yet patient action. And after what seemed like an eternity, he pressed the last crinkled part of the tape together and started to wind it back up. Well, looks like we're all done here. Nice and flat. He pulled over a wheeled rack containing a TV and a VCR and slid the tape in. Let's see what life she's got left in her. The two of us watched the first part of the tape. My mom and I cheerfully playing with an adorable musical teddy bear. What part got eaten up? I didn't answer. On the camera my mom gave me a big hug and a hot pinch slowly poured down my insides as anticipation overwhelmed me. I felt like I was starting to remember something terrible. My dad put the camera down on the floor, and the tape glitched out where it normally did. Only this time the picture was legible. The tape appeared to play a bit slower, so the voices were distorted. Whenever someone talked, they sounded slightly deep and demonic. Is that better than it was before? I started to reply, when the memory came crashing back with the force of waves on rocks. Oh my god. This day. This fucking awful day. The camera had still been on the floor, 
My dad had stormed out of the room. Ben? The sound of feet stomped back into the room. Ben, what are you doing? Fucking shut up! My dad knelt down on the floor and got right in my face with what looked like a steak knife. The tip was within inches of my nose. You fucking faggot! Ben, let him go. I said shut the fuck up! This little bitch wants to play with girl toys and I'm fucking sick of it! Here, be a man! Cut it up! In the video I began to cry. My distorted wailing was loud enough to cause the plastic on the TV set to vibrate. The fact that the tape was still playing everyone's voices slower than normal just added to the horror that came flooding back to me. The repairman turned to look at me in horror. Jesus, is that you? I couldn't answer. My eyes were glued to the TV. The video skipped, then came back. Are you going to do it? Benjamin, stop. My dad got up, and off camera, he either hit or punched my mom. I don't know where, but it knocked her right to the ground. It was so loud, like cannon fire underwater. Blood had fallen and splattered onto the wall right next to where she was standing at leaving big red marks in the background. My mom fell backwards out of the doorway and lay on the ground a few seconds while my dad went back over to me. I could see her in the background, trying to pick herself back up. My dad grabbed the knife again and held it up to my terrified four-year-old self. He stabbed the knife directly at my chest with the full intensity of his rage, but the teddy bear took the brunt of the hit. I heard the tiny music from the bear play its plastic heart lit up with all of its vibrant colors. Dad pulled back the knife with the toy still impaled upon it and began stabbing the floorboard right next to me repeatedly until the blade snapped. The bear fell to the ground, a giant hole torn through it. Stuffing flew all around my stunned, terrified face like snow. The camera auto-focused on me for a moment, not seeming to know what else to focus on. I suddenly began bawling my tiny eyes out and picked up the bear again, clumsily trying to put its stuffing back in. My dad caught his breath and picked up the camera, but was interrupted by my mom standing up. He set the camera down facing the wall. I heard rapid footsteps and my crying starting to fade, and I assumed my mom was carrying me down the hallway. The video started playing its audio normally again, as it reached the end of the section that was damaged. Feet had appeared on the right side of the TV screen. Someone had picked up the camera again. I'm sorry. It won't happen again, alright? I love you. I love you too. I stopped the tape and looked back over to the clerk, who was looking at the blank screen in shock and disgust. Kid, what was all that about? My father was a monster. My mom knew he was a monster. They kept this incident of his stabbing at me a secret for all these years. I don't know what to say or how to react. My father had intended to kill me in a blind rage, and if not for a stuffed bear, very likely would have succeeded. Part of me wanted to cry, but another part of me refused to allow it. In my back pocket, my cell phone began to ring. I checked the caller ID. It was my dad. There's always a reason to be afraid.